those of you in the building and also watching online, a couple reminders this morning that if you are in the building, we just encourage you to social distance and wear your masks when you are walking around the building. As well as during worship, we ask that you refrain from singing, unfortunately, but there are also many other ways we worship God. So let's all stand together. Let's lift up a praise. Woo. And 
passes the word and he couldn't fill me a man's empty praise and treasures I feel I never enough and you came along and put me back together Now satisfied, give me your love. Who oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you, God. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. Cause the God of the mountain is the God of the valley, and there's not a place. King of my heart, be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from. Oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life. Oh, he is my song, because you are good.
goodness of God. And on my life, you have been faithful. On my life, and on my life, you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will say of the goodness. Hallelujah. 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 Precious Lord. How many have experienced the goodness of God? Amen. He is the same God yesterday, today, and forever. His goodness, His mercy, His grace. I'm still at times overwhelmed with God, in awe before Him, His love, His love. If I can encourage you with something, James says to draw near to Him, to God, and He will draw near to you. I pray that you would have a hunger to know God more and more. I became, uh, I received Christ as my Lord and Savior just over 50 years ago. I know I don't look it. Thank you. And one of the things as, as a teenager I prayed for is that, God, I, I wouldn't get comfortable with him. I never want to get comfortable with God that I take him for granted. And I, I'm still at times just in awe of who he is and that he would reach down and call me to himself. Draw near to him. There are depths of God that you have not experienced yet. Of who he is and his love for you. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer. I'm Pastor Kevin, one of the pastors on staff here. Pastor Todd is away uh, this week. This weekend he'll be back in the office this week. And uh, there are a number of our families who have been going through and who have been dealing with grief, and of course the Quins being the recent ones, the Thompson family, and we want to pray for them. There are a number of people who have been going through some um, illness, some situations, testing, sickness, and we want to pray that God just intervene and move into their hearts and lives. Uh, Roland Cooper, many of you will know, um, is at St. Joe's uh, Continuing Care planning on, on going into a nursing home, but he had a heart attack. It was in the hospital this week. He's back at St. Joe's, but we just want to pray for him and, uh, and Marina, that God would be with them. I talked to her, and she, she, she says, she talks, and it's just amazing how even Roland in this state, he, he's been praying for her every night, her at the apartment alone, and, and uh, their faith and trust in God is still surreal. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we look to you, Almighty God. You are worthy to receive all praise and all glory. And God, we pause right now to give you thanks for who you are, what you've done, what you're doing, and God, what you will do. God, we pray that you would be glorified, that you would be lifted up, that you would be seen in our lives by those around us, and that, God, they would give you praise, that they would be drawn to you as they see us faithful and trusting, 
drawing near to you, letting your love flow through us into those around us. God, that this world would be drawn to you. You said if, if Christ is lifted up, you would draw all men. Lord, we pray that you would be lifted up in our hearts and in our lives, that people would see you and be drawn to you. Your love is still drawing people. Your mercy and grace is still forgiving people. Your spirit is still healing hearts and lives that are broken. You're still filling people with your presence and making them new in Christ Jesus. Lord, move by your spirit. God, you know each of us here those watching online, I pray, God, that you would, as we lift our needs to you, that you would move by your Spirit. Work in circumstances and situations. And, God, we pray that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There is no greater thing we could pray for but that your will be done and that, God, you would be glorified. So, Lord, we pray it right now. We lift our needs and, and those of our congregation, those of God who have been dealing with and who are dealing with grief and loss. I pray that the God of all comfort would rest upon them even right now. That God, they would sense and know the comfort and strength of your presence in Jesus' name. Those, God, needing physical healing, you are still the same God. You are still almighty. And we pray and release healing power in Jesus' name to touch hearts and lives, bring healing and strength into them. That God, again, you would be glorified. Father, be with us. Now, the rest of our service, God, as uh, Pastor Sherry brings your word, God, I just pray an anointing upon her, but also upon us to hear and receive your word today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Pastor Mandy is going to come. morning. Um, whether you are joining with us here in the main auditorium or you are joining with us online, we just want to welcome you and thank you for being with us. I don't know about you, but I find that Sunday morning I have the most opposition when it comes to getting to church. It's the morning that my kids finally sleep in and it's the morning that I'm two steps behind where I always want to be. Um, so if that's you this morning, I want you to know that we see you and we thank you for the effort that you made to get here this morning. No matter what your morning looked like, we just trust and know that God has something for you this morning. If this is your first time with us, hello, welcome. I am Pastor Mandy and I'm the kids pastor here. If you feel comfortable, please send us an email to info at gtsudbury.ca and one of our staff would love to connect with you. Now, normally, during this time in the service, we have offering baskets that are passed kind of back and forth, but we're in a different season right now, and um, instead, we have some little black boxes located at the back of the auditorium at the main doors there, and you can leave your tithes and offerings there. Or if you feel more comfortable, you can give digitally and securely on our website at gtsudbury.ca slash give. Now... That's it for announcements, hard to believe. Um, but Pastor Sherry is on her way with our final installment of our sermon series, The Seven Churches of Revelation. Uh, ever been part of a service with me, either in kids' church or adult service? I start the service the same way every single time. And what I do is I ask you to put your palms up. And you know, I've seen this for so many years with the kids when they would come and they would take their hands and they would put them up to God. God was faithful always to teach them something when they do that. And I want to learn today too. So if you will put your palms up, we're going to pray again. Lord, I just thank you so much because you are a good God. 
I thank you that as we've come through all the seven churches and on the final one, that Lord, you, you have said over and over and over, you want us to hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So may Glad Tidings Church, whether we are online today or whether we are in this building, would you open our ears and our eyes so that we can receive all that you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Now, part of being a former children's pastor is I come with props every single time. It probably drives everybody crazy, but it's, it's just how it's going to be and probably until I die. It's just in me. And so I've come with a few props. We'll go through those in a minute. But we're talking today about the lukewarm church. And Pastor Todd told me this is actually one, one of the scriptures that pastors don't actually like to preach. So I don't know what's wrong with me because I'm excited to preach this. I'm super excited for what God has for us today. So we're going to learn a little bit about Laodicea first. Laodicea was located on the, the trade route. It was like a crossroads and there was a Roman road that went through it. And so it was quite popular. If you were going to one place, you'd have to go through Laodicea. Laodicea had um, an eye salve, so if you had troubles with your eyes, you would go to Laodicea, and you'd travel far and wide to get there. Laodicea would have been considered pretty affluent. It had a banking system. Laodicea was like the hub and the place to be. And for ladies who liked to shop, it had a nice shiny black wool that you wouldn't find anywhere else. And so it was, it was something that was sought out. But I like when we read scripture, I'm one of those people that kind of, I guess maybe because I worked in kids ministry for so long, that I have to get into that scripture and I have to feel what it would have felt like. And so would you join me on that journey of just kind of trying to feel what it would feel like as you've traveled to Laodicea, you've come for that eye salve, you've come for that banking center, you've come for the, the hub of what's happening. Now picture the people in Laodicea they get message there is a scroll that is about to be read before them. That Jesus Christ himself has given a vision to the last remaining disciple, John. And I picture what would it be like as they gathered around and they're sitting. Would they be sitting there saying, wow, like we made one of the seven churches. Like we made the cut on this one. Jesus has addressed us personally. Would they be kind of proud in 17 AD, Laodicea had an earthquake that went through. And when the earthquake went through, it had decimated much of the area. And when Rome actually came in and offered to help Laodicea, they said, no, we're good, because they were self-sufficient. So they probably thought that this was a report card that Jesus was sending to them that was, look at how great you are, look at how good that you're doing. And so this is my husband, Stuart. My family always gets roped in some way. I do props, and my family gets roped in. And so he's going to read the scripture of Laodicea. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works, you're neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy gold refined in the fire. Do you not see the good things that we're doing? We've got this eye salve. People are traveling from far and wide, and we are helping people. We're helping them to see again. Isn't it incredible the good works that we're doing? I desire for you to come and buy salve from me so that I can anoint your eyes and you will see. Look at my garments. 
See what I bought when I was downtown the other day? This nice shiny black wool, this garment that all the ladies from the other towns want. We have wonderful garments in our town. We're sought out for our garments. But you are naked. I desire to give you white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. You see, each one of us that have come inside these doors or online today, we all have a view of our own lives and we all have a view of what we're building our lives on. And we have that view of what makes it a success. For some of us, it's, it's education. We've got that education. For some of us, it's, it's, it's what's in our bank account, how much we have in our retirement. It's, it's different for each one of us. But my prayer for today is that God is going to shift our view from how we see things and allow us to see how he sees things because he sees things in a different way and it's for our good. Now, I love the fact, you know, especially because I like to speak with objects and I like to speak with things that make sense to me, but so did Jesus. Jesus used things that were so relatable to them. He used uh, things that they could, concepts they could kind of understand. So when he's talking about hot or cold in this scripture, it was so real to them. Because everything that Laodicea had, the one thing they didn't have was water. So they built their whole foundation of their world and their, was upon this trade route. It was upon success. It was upon placing themselves strategically for success. But it wasn't placing himself where there was a living water. And so it says there was a pipeline that came in. And I think it was six miles long. And by the time it got to them, the water that they drank was actually lukewarm. And I actually watched an archaeology show this past week and showing those, the remainder of the, the pipes and how there would be sedimentation, and it was full of minerals. And so what it meant was it wasn't only lukewarm when it got to them, it, was, it would have stunk. It would have been gross. But not too far from Laodicea was a place called Heropolis. And Heropolis was known for its hot springs. So people would seek it out for its hot springs, hot streams and it was just a place to be to 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 go for soothing and there was another place called Colossae and that place got its water from the mountain and the water would come down and it, the snow would melt and they would get fresh cold water not like Laodicea and so when the scripture says you're neither hot nor cold, they understood this and they totally understood the idea of being spewed out of your mouth because I bet you when you went to Laodicea for the first time, if you didn't get the memo that the water was terrible, you might have been spitting it out of your mouth. And once you learned that, you probably brought bottled water with you from Colossae or somewhere else because you didn't want their water. It wasn't good. Now, as I started to get ready for this service, I started to think about the cold and the hot. And this represents the cold church, and this represents the hot church. And my mind went to places of the past. My mind went to places of what I wanted to see in the future. And God, what does a hot, piping hot church look like? How would that transform our programs? How would that transform our youth? How would that transform um, us as a church? And God just challenged me and said, that is not what I'm talking about to you in this. What he said to me is, he said, this is about me changing the hearts of the people in their homes, with their families, when you're driving down the road and you get cut off. This is about changing our hearts in our workplaces and everywhere that we go. And so we're gonna to go to the Old Testament. We're gonna look at two kingdoms. There's one that I would consider cold and there is one I consider hot. And, but before we do that, I'm gonna have Stuart read a scripture and it's the warning that God gave to the children of Israel before they entered the promised land. And when the Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give you 
with great and good cities that you did not build, houses full of good things that you did not fill, cisterns that you did not dig, and vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant. And when you eat and are full, take care, lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. It is the Lord God you shall fear, him you shall serve, and by his name you shall swear. You shall not go out to other gods, the gods of the people who are around you. For the Lord your God in your midst is a jealous God, lest the anger of the Lord your God be kindled against you, and he destroy you from off the face of the earth. I love the fact that he warns them going into the promised land. And part of the warning is about becoming too comfortable. I think that I, it's really cool how the Word of God says that you're going into this land, but none of it really, you didn't build these houses, you didn't build these cities. And I think God wants to bring us to a place where we can say, my job came from you, God. My bank account comes from you. Everything I have, Lord, is yours. And so he said, when you get too comfortable, be careful and listen to this word or you will bring in idols. You will bring all the things I didn't ask for you to bring in. And when that happens, we don't get to partake in the blessing. We don't get to partake in all that God has. And so we're going to look at Ahaz first. And uh, he's actually the king of Judah in the capital of Jerusalem. And he was a nasty king. He was bad news. If I was in kids' church right now, I would say to the kids, say bad news, and they'd say bad news. It's bad news. Some of the things that Ahaz did is he did absolutely opposite to everything God said. He didn't hear what the word of the Lord said. Isaiah had come to him several times. He didn't heed and listen to what Isaiah said to him. He had idols on every corner. He, he resurrected altars. And you know what happens when we, we trust in ourselves and we trust and we build our lives on a, on a system that's not of God? Then when troubles come, we don't have that place to go because we don't, we don't get to walk into the blessing of that. And so there was a formidable army at the time, and it was Assyria. And Assyria, when they would march out, it would be like ants across the land. There was so many of them. And Assyria destroyed everything everything in their path. They not only had destroyed everything in their path, they tortured the cities. They would take a hold of all the officials of the cities, and they would torture them, and they would take the, the, the officials and the kings from one city, and they would bring them to the next city to create such a fear to say, we are coming, and we are going to take you out. And so because King Ahaz no, had no foundation. He didn't listen. He didn't repent. He didn't walk into the blessing. Because of that, he became, let me see if I say this right, vassal nation. Got it. I had to practice that. Which meant that he paid tribute. He stripped the temple of all the gold. He paid tribute to Assyria. And basically, they weren't allowed to own weapons. They weren't allowed to uh, prosper in any way. And they paid every penny to Assyria. And Assyria continued to conquer nation after nation after nation. But one of the worst things in my mind that Ahaz did is he worshipped a god called Moloch. Now, Moloch was a fire god, and he worshipped that god. And what they would do is they would offer sacrifices to those gods, and they would offer them to kind of appease that god, whoever that god was. And so he offered a sacrifice, but he offered his son as that sacrifice. And he offered him, and it, was, it would have been uh, throwing his son into the fire of, of Moloch. But what we don't realize here, although he's not listening, he's not repenting, nobody really wants to follow Ahaz. I certainly wouldn't. I wouldn't want to be one of his sons, that's for sure. He's not walking into the blessing. He's into a place of bondage to Assyria. But who's coming behind him but Hezekiah? And Hezekiah would be considered, in my mind, a hot kingdom. He was considered to be one of the best kings that there was. Hezekiah, it says that in the first month 
of the first year of his reign, he opened the doors to the temple again. He consecrated all of the Levites. He consecrated all of the priests. He understood that he heard what Isaiah said and the word of the Lord said. He understood that repentance, and he's about to walk into the blessing of God and that covenant relationship with God. He opens up all of the doors. He starts to bring things back. And so he decides that he's going to bring back one of the, I think it's the Passover feast. So he sends a message out through all the country. And he sends the message out to say to return to God. Return. Many of these people would never have done one of these feasts. And it was so old from the time that Ahaz had, had really stripped everything bare and stripped everything that they knew of God. But he says, repent. He sent it out to Judah. He sent it out to Israel. He sent it out all around them. He said, return. We've talked so much about COVID in the last little bit, and you hear all of the different things that everybody has to say. And you know, one thing I will tell you that's just so strongly in my heart right now is yes, we are in a time like no other time. We are in a time like no other time. But we are in a time where I believe with my whole spirit that there is a message going out across the world to God's children, return to me. Return to me. Return to me. And it's interesting in that, that we have been stripped of so many things that caused us to run we have been stripped of so many things that we found our entertainment in and our false entertainment in. And I believe the Spirit of the Lord is speaking to us today to return. But Hezekiah sends this message out. He sends it out for them to return. He has his Passover feast, and, and they bring so much into the temple, he stops paying his tribute to Assyria. He says, I'm going to trust the one true living God. I'm no longer going to pay Assyria. And so he stops that whole process. And God starts to bless him. But each of us know this. I know it for myself. I'm walking it even out this week. It's a process. It's such a process trusting God. It's such a process to learn to trust more and more and more, even when things get difficult. And so... When he cut off the money to Assyria, Assyria started on the march. Instead, headed out against nation upon nation. And so Hezekiah did some really amazing things. Hezekiah, unlike Laodicea, understood how important the water was. So Laodicea, not Laodicea, Hezekiah built a tunnel through the mountain. And he stopped up all the springs so that when the army came against them, he said, I'm not going to give my water to the Assyrian kings. I'm going to feed my people the water. It says he fortified all of the walls. And then he did something that he probably shouldn't have done, and we've all done it. He made a covenant or he made a relationship with Egypt and Babylon and some other countries around to say, you know what, if, if they come against us, we'll come help you, you come help us. But God is so gracious. God is so gracious. It says that the Assyrian army comes against him and he makes another error, but he's considered one of the best kings. His next error is the fact that he then pays the tribute to Assyria. And he says, I will give you this money, and I will um, just go back. And, and basically, I think they were going to become a vassal nation again. And so they went back to Assyria, but they decided, no, we're going to make them surrender. So they come back to Hezekiah. And they did something they never should have done. I think they did it the first time, but this time I think Hezekiah gets it. You see, they had already had all these nations that were supposed to come to their, to their rescue. They were gone because they'd already been conquered. But they stood outside the walls 
and they started to hurl insults at God, the one true living God. They sent this letter up to be read by Hezekiah that says, basically, we have wiped out God's all across this nation. What makes you think that your God is any bigger? What makes you think your God is going to come to the rescue? It's nothing to us. And God take, Hezekiah takes that letter and he places it before God. He says, God, what do you have to say about this? I've been to those places in my life where it's, wow, this is just not making sense, God. This is not what I thought. This is not how this was supposed to go out. And I can tell you when I waited upon God, maybe not immediately, not immediately, some things I've waited years for, but God answered those prayers. And so as he's placed this out before God, Isaiah has a message from the Lord. And that message is that God will defend them. Now, they would have heard everything that was happening in the camps. They would have heard the rumble. They would have had all the fear. But all of a sudden, the camp became silent. This, the camp of Assyria, there's no rumbling of horses this morning. They don't hear anybody getting out of their tents. What happened to the Assyrians? Maybe this is a ploy, they thought. Maybe this is a ploy to scare us. And so they waited. They didn't get up. They didn't get up. And they looked down and said, is that a body over there? And what God did was he sent the angel of death, and those that stood against the name of God, he wiped out 185,000 of them. Hezekiah, I would say, was hot, but he wasn't perfect. He was in that journey that many of us are on. He was on that journey. Well, I'm going to talk a little bit about the lukewarm believer. And uh, some of you might wonder why I have this flower up here. Because it makes no sense, but it will in a moment. So in the middle of COVID, actually the beginning of COVID, I remember there was a moment uh, I had gone to Costco. Nothing was open except for the grocery stores. We weren't at the place yet where we all had to wear masks. But I made this decision. My mom lives with us, for those of you who didn't know. I made this decision I was going to buy my mother a flower. Because I thought, can't do this, I can't do that, but I'm gonna bring this beautiful flower home to my mom. So I'm in Costco, I'm in the area where I'd usually find hydrangeas, all of that stuff, and I'm kind of in a busy hurry, because it's kind of tense, you know how it was, it was tense, wasn't buying toilet paper at the time, but I was buying other stuff. And so I find my flower. I put it in the cart and I go through my list of everything else that I'm doing. And I remember standing in line and these two gentlemen talking about how beautiful this flower was. They thought it was just beautiful. And so we talked about it. I remember going in the cart. It was still cold outside. And I remember kind of guarding my, my flower for my mom, this little gift I had for her to bring joy into her living room. And, and I remember thinking, it's cold. Keep it safe. I got this home, and she was really thrilled. In fact, she said many times, isn't that flower pretty? It's so pretty. You see, I bought her these from the grocery store before, and there was a lady that told me, if you ever want to know how to water one of these, that two to three ice cubes once a week. And that's what we did. Two to three ice cubes once a week. I never really looked at it again. I had done my job. I placed it down on the thing. And all summer long, she decided she was not going to bring that to camp. It might not make the trip. And so she asked my husband, Stuart, all summer long, Stuart, just a reminder, two to three ice cubes, once a week. It's Monday, put them in. And so when she came back, she was quite delighted that her flower was looking so good. Until a few weeks ago, I'm making pizza in the kitchen, our kitchen, my mom's living room's there, our kitchen is here. I'm making homemade pizza and I've got my table full to freeze them all. My brother says, why is there ice cubes in that plant? My mom goes in to start to explain the fact, two to three ice cubes once a week, that's what you need to do to keep the plant healthy. Isn't that wonderful? Stuart watered it for me all summer long until he said this, that plant is not real. No word of a lie. So I have my hands in the pizza dough and I stop. And you would think my response would be, you're kidding me. 
but I got mad. I actually was annoyed with him. I'm like, that plan so is real. I bought that plan at Costco. Costco doesn't sell fake plants. I bought that plant in the place where you always buy the hydrangeas. That's where the real plants are. I wouldn't buy a fake plant. I don't even like fake plants. So he leaves, and I walk out to my mother's living room, and all of a sudden I, I start to pick it apart and go, oh my gosh, it's not real. And uh, my mother thinks this is hysterical. She thinks this is the funniest thing. She's taking pictures of it. She's sending it to everybody she knows that how funny this is. I'm horrified. I'm so horrified that I have actually bought a fake plant. I told her it was a real plant. But it's kind of like the lukewarm faith. Nobody sets out to be lukewarm. Don't. And had I have taken the moments that needed to take to actually examine this plant in the very beginning, I would have known it wasn't real. I think sometimes where we build our lives, we we are a little bit like Laodicea that we build our lives on what we think and what we want, and we want to pipe that water in, that living water, and we're, we're frustrated that it's stale, and we're frustrated that our faith stinks. We're frustrated by it. Why is it that way? But it's pretty clear that we are to hear the word that the Spirit says to us to today that he's asking us to repent so that we can partake in the blessing. What changed for Hezekiah in the end is God changed his point of view slowly to seeing it as he saw it. Hezekiah's words were, um, we fight with the arm. They fight with the arm of flesh. We fight with the arm of God. He knew it. He got it. He may have lost it a few times, you never know, because we all struggle, but he knew to repent. We're going to go back to the last portion. I'm going to have Kaylee uh, come forward and the worship team. We're going to go back, and Stuart is going to read um, the last part of the scripture of Laodicea. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. It says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. I've heard that scripture so many times, but I've never thought about the fact that um, we're being beckoned into this relationship to dine with this amazing living God. I've never thought about the fact that what opens that door is actually repentance. I won't lie, I kind of battled this message out this week, and there was a place in it that I had to get on my face before God and say, God, if there's anything in me, if there's anything that's standing before me and being that hot Christian, because we can, we can talk about the lukewarm Christian. And I think that we all have lukewarm places in our hearts. I think we all have them. And so I found myself in my room on my face before God, saying, God, if there's anything, I don't want that. I want to be on fire for you. Not necessarily just in the church service, but in my home to radically change my family, in my workplace, which happens to be here, um, in my car. Stuart's going to go and he's going to read the last, um, the last chapter of Revelations. And it's the last few verses of what is said to us. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay everyone for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning 
and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the sexually immoral and the murderers and the adulterers and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come. Let the one who hears say, come and let the one who is thirsty come let the one who desires take the water of life without price as i said i believe there is a call across the world right now stop fussing about the masks what you think about this or that start listening to the call of god to return and what does that mean to you and your giftings in your home and your family? For some of us, it may be return because maybe we really, you know, understand the lukewarm church. And, and to be honest, I can't stand this plant now. I actually can't stand it. I have to replace it because now that I know it's not real, it just irritates me. And I hope that that's what you get as God is revealing things to you today. But we have this amazing God that says, Come return. He wants us to hear what the Spirit says to the church today, to Glad Tidings Church. Kaylee's going to sing a song, and I want you to take some moments, and I, I think I have to trust that God has been speaking to you, and he's telling you things that he can only tell you, and, and, and there's something that's stirring in your heart right now, but sit in that for a bit. We're going to sing one song, and let God speak to you. There's nothing impossible
God, the bed will be lost to you. Every fear I lay at your feet, and I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the bed will be lost to you. Oh, the bed will be lost to you, Lord. Oh, whatever the battle may look like for you, we're surrendering on our knees today, Lord. We say we give you the addiction, Lord. It's yours, Lord. We give you the hell problems, God. They're all yours. The depression is yours, Lord. We surrender it over, Lord. Whatever the anxiety is over, we give it to you. We say it's yours, Lord. Because you can have the battle. You have the battle. And in our victory we've won. You have already won, Lord. Oh, God. You have won, Lord. You have won. Oh, it's time. It's time. Now's the time, Lord. Lord, equip us. Lord, build up your army, God. We're going with you to fight the battle. Oh, now's the time, Lord. It's time that the captives are set free. We're going to hang on for another minute. It's so interesting that Kaylee got on her knees because the whole time I prepared for this, I, I felt like God wanted us to have altars in our homes, places we got on our knees. So thank you, Kaylee. We're going we're gonna to hold on for another second. We're going to hold on for another few minutes because God is still speaking to our hearts. Don't push it away what God is speaking. We started with our palms up. God. today, what the Spirit is saying to this church. We've heard, and Father, I pray, and we come as a church, and we repent before you. We repent if there is anything in us that God keeps us in a place of deception, like this plant. God, we should be constantly talking of the, your goodness and the things you're doing. We should be growing. We should have stories to tell what you've done last week and the week before and the week before. And as we examine our hearts, if there's, if there's no stories of what's new this year to last year, God, I pray that at this next part, that God, you are going to teach us the things that God, you are doing and where you are moving in our lives, God, as we repent. And Lord, as you are on the other side of that door and you are saying, come, I'm knocking. My child, I have been waiting for you to come to the end of yourself. 
so that I can come in and I can wrap you up. And those things that you see one way, I've been waiting to take them and put them over here. Fall in love with me again, my child. When you were once hot, remembering back to that place. Oh, God desires for us to radically change our workplaces. God desires for us to radically change our families and our homes. And so, Lord, we dedicate the rest of this to you, God. I pray that as we leave this church today, God, that that the enemy will not steal this word away from us. That, God, this is going to be like me and hating this plant now. That, God, we're going to hate the things that have deceived us and hate the things that have held us back because now truth has been revealed by the Spirit of the living God. So, Lord, go with us as we go. We dedicate the rest of this time to you. In your name, amen.